So we're going to talk about a hodgepodge of topics right now. For that, let's welcome in Randy Frederick, Managing Director, Trading Derivatives at Charles Schwab. Randy, thanks for coming. Hi, Renita. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I actually want to start with a brief look backwards. You spotted some trends that happened in the market in September. Walk us through those. Well, September has this long history of being a really terrible month in the market. In fact, it's been down about 56 percent of the time, going back about 70 some years. And that really hasn't gotten any better. Some of these old trends have gotten have improved in recent years. This one has not. In fact, as you know, we, we, the S&P 500 lost ground in September. It was the fourth consecutive year in a row that we went down in September. And in fact, it's been six out of the last nine years that it's gone down in September. The good thing is markets usually get a little bit better in October, although you can't tell that so far by the first couple of days of trading this month. Uh, so it just has a long history of being a terrible time. But the good thing is when you get so low, usually then the only direction is up, although this quarter has started out a little bit shaky, certainly tell you that this quarter started out so shaky. I mean, today, worse than yesterday. We see significant declines today. Yeah, that's true. I mean, and there are a lot of catalysts out there that are weighing on this. Obviously, we've got some dysfunction in Congress. Um, we've got a potential ouster of the Speaker of the House that hasn't happened in a couple of hundred years, which is a long time going back. We've got the triple threat of the higher, stronger dollar higher crude oil prices and ever higher interest rates. I mean, the 10-year the, uh, Treasury is at a 16-year high going all the way back to 2007. That then, of course, presents a, a pretty you know, compelling alternative to a stock. When, you, when you're looking at, at, depending upon the length of the Treasury, you look at anywhere between about 4.5% and 5.5% yields, um, which if you held a Treasury till maturity comes back at 100%, that's a pretty compelling alternative to investing in an equity that has a dividend yield that's higher than that. And frankly, there just aren't that many of them. So it, it, it makes it very difficult. The other challenge is it presents refinancing challenges for smaller companies that are indebted because as that debt rolls over, they continue to have to refinance at higher and higher prices, which makes it very difficult for them. That's one of the reasons why we see the mega caps outperforming the smaller and mid caps because they generally have pretty strong balance sheets. Talk to me about the VIX as we get into this conversation of risk and how markets are interpreting it. It climbed over that dangerous 20 level today. Why is it so dangerous and what is the road ahead? Yeah, the 20 level is not really the danger level, but it's sort of the start of that. So oh. I've been analyzing the VIX for well for the whole 30 years that it's been around. And generally, if you stay below 20, you're kind of in what I call the normal zone. Once you get between about 20 and 30, you're in that elevated uncertainty zone. Today, for the first time since June 1st, when the debt ceiling deal was signed, we've seen the VIX creep above 20, which means the uncertainty level has gotten quite a bit higher. Prior to the debt ceiling, where, where for most of the beginning of this year, people were worried about a potential debt default, it was above that level a lot. But now that, it's, that we've had that deal, um, this is the first time since then. So the level of uncertainty, in other words, traders' comfort with their ability to forecast what's coming up here in the next month or two has now elevated to the point where there's just a lot of uncertainty. It's not panic yet, and it's not high, high anxiety. High anxiety kind of comes in at 30, and panic comes in at 40, which we haven't seen that since the, since the pandemic hit. But it certainly shows that there's a lot of uncertainty and a little bit of worry going on right now in volatility. Worry indeed, but let's talk about earnings because believe it or not, it kicks off next week all over again, right? What are you watching in these quarterly reports? Well, earnings season does kick off unofficially on Tuesday of next week when we'll start to get some of the big cap names will come in and in the latter part of next week, we'll get some of the big banks, which tend to be some of the early, um, the early reporters. Hopefully that will be a catalyst that can counterbalance some of these negative catalysts we have and lift these markets up a bit. So that's a whole week from now, unfortunately. Um, we've got a couple of challenges in the meantime. Oh, well, back on earnings first though. The good thing about earnings is that we think the earnings trough, at least the most of the most of the data shows us that the earnings trough for this year happened in Q2. So the expectations for earnings um, this quarter, um, the reporting since just about to start is essentially flat with about a one and a half percent gain in revenues. And both of those numbers would be slightly better than what we saw in Q2. So the other thing is that they generally are better than the expectations, which means that we're certainly on the upswing on earnings and the expectations for Q4, which we're now in, are even better. So that should 
be a bit of a positive catalyst offsetting some of these other negative things. A positive catalyst for sure, but I'd be interested in looking at the outlooks as well because seasonality also plays into all of this. Do you have any expectations yeah. for the outlooks for the next quarter after that or even the full year? Yeah, so again, all of the expectations going forward from here on are, are supposed to be improving. For Q3, it's supposed to be better than Q2. Q4 better yet, and the outlook for, for even 2024 is still very, very strong. Obviously, that can change if things continue to deteriorate. If we go into a major downturn and sustain this throughout the remainder of this quarter, that could all change. But at the moment, the uh, the, positive, the the companies that have provided guidance, and this is an important factor, the number of companies providing guidance is higher this quarter than we've seen in several years. And the number of companies providing positive guidance is also very strong. So again, it's not just analysts, but the companies themselves that are expecting things to continue to improve throughout the remainder of this year and into next year. So that's a positive thing. Now, one negative potential catalyst that we might see this week is the labor market. Mm -hmm. We got a jump today. It was stronger than expected. That was one of the catalysts also pulling the markets down today. Right. There's been very little deterioration in the labor market, which it doesn't sound like a good thing, but really that's what we need. We need to see deterioration in the labor market. That's what the Fed's been trying to engineer um, in order to see inflation pressures ease. That hasn't really happened yet. And unfortunately, this particular report is going to de de uh, reflect initial jobless claims primarily from the second half of August and the first half of September. And in each case, those claims came down, which means that not only is the labor market strong, it's actually getting stronger based on that data. So I think the estimate we're, for what we can expect in non-farm payables on Friday of this week might actually be a little bit too low. Hmm. And unfortunately, I don't think that's going to bode well for the markets on Friday. All right, we'll see if it's enough to inflict action from the Fed in a different direction. Randy Frederick, thanks so much for joining us.